American Space Museum, Space Walk of Fame. We'll go check that out. I am in Titusville, Florida, which is directly across well, what I thought was some sort of an inlet off of the Atlantic Ocean, right where the Cape is. Um, but in fact, it's the Indian River, which separates mainland Florida from the Kennedy uh, Space Center out on the Cape. But yeah, so I'm, I'm really close to the uh, Kennedy Space Center and the uh, launch pads for, well, what seems to be these days <laughs> rather dominated by uh, SpaceX. And uh, also Artemis, uh, which is uh, kind of up and coming. But I think I've found here probably one of the uh, hidden gems of a museum. And I'm about to get a personal tour, and I'm going to take you on that. As you might imagine, I've had to cut the tour down substantially because it was quite a long tour. Fascinating, and I really enjoyed uh, every moment of it. Uh, but I will... I guess, as always, tell you that there's so much more to be seen and you really should go to the American Space Museum in Titusville, Florida if you are in the area and maybe trying to catch a, a Starlink launch or uh, an Artemis launch or something coming off of the uh, uh, Kennedy Space Flight Center's launch pads. So uh, let's, uh, let's go and uh, check out this tour. Hi, I'd like to introduce you to Barry Smith. Um, hi, Barry. Um, we're at the uh, Space American Mu Space American the American Space Museum in Titusville, uh, in Titusville Florida. Florida. And um, tell us a little bit about your career, Barry. You started uh, telling me, and I thought, boy, yeah, I better uh, get in, the camera on. Uh, I came from uh, Newport, Rhode Island, where I worked at the Navy War College ah. and was transferred to Goddard Space Flight Center, where I worked there for 30 years. Uh, 20 of those years I worked at the on the James Webb Telescope, mm. another six years on the James Webb Telescope, which is today doing some fantastic, fantastic work. In, and discoveries. Right. Uh, another a couple of years, I worked at on the uh, robotics uh, research and development, and then I finished off my career as a uh, cryogenics manager. So I I had a pretty decent career and uh, got to meet a lot of the astronauts that flew on the, the on the Hubble and great people, really terrific people. It almost seemed to me that they, it was a prerequisite that they have to, not have to, but their personalities are just fantastic. Right. They're always very warm, agreeable, easy to talk to, and they never, never did I ever feel as if I had a, they had an ear about themselves, you know, very, very nice people. That's awesome. Well, generally I'll talk, I'll start my tour out with uh, Robert Goddard. He's from my home state of uh, Massachusetts, born in Worcester, and uh, back in 1922, he was the, uh, started to do the, uh, his launches on his aunt's farm in Auburn, Mass. And as you can see here, this is our first this is our first uh, command center. <laughs> the Black House. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and this is our first crawler. <laughs> That's wonderful. What was that old Ford uh, Model T truck? Yeah, and the, and he towed all of his equipment out to his, to the farm, and um, that's where he started doing his launches of the liquid uh, the liquid fuel. Um, today, the uh, the farm is now a golf course, oh. but the golf course uh, allowed to have a monument built for uh, Robert Goddard, where he did his launches. That's awesome. The Germans. The Germans at Von Braun. Mm -hmm. Very, very intelligent guy, man, and uh, he was one that developed the V-2 rocket. 
He was the main man behind it. Mm -hmm. And of course, we know the history of how much uh, Von Braun, the V2 rockets, uh, did so much damage to London. Right. That, um, and it was a very, very powerful rocket. Um, after the war, Von Braun was given a choice. Either you can go to Russia or you can go to the United States. And without hesitation, Von Braun took the United States. Mm -hmm. And the United States gave him Huntsville, Alabama, where we have um, Marshall Space Flight Center. Mm -hmm. And that's where he went and took his crew of uh, other engineers, scientists, and technicians, brought them with him, and uh, developed, uh, started to develop Huntsville, Alabama. Um, thank God he did. Right. Thank God he did, because what was going on we were blowing up rockets left and right on the launch pad. They may be able to get two to three hundred feet off the ground and it would it would blow up. So it was just in time Von Braun came in and uh, helped get us, should I say, lifted, lifted us up and off the, off the launch pad and into space. Right. Now Ham was trained. Ham was trained by uh, by the United States, and he was uh, given commands that he would have to re respond to. Mm -hmm. And every time he got something right, he would get a banana chip. <laughs> okay. But every time he did something wrong, they had electrodes. Oh no! Attached to his foot. Oh no! And every time he did something wrong, he would get zapped. So here he is on the launch pad getting ready for launch. He's mm. he got all the uh, connectors, and this is his, like his little uh, seat that they would put in the capsule. And this photograph is of him. Of, uh, he's ready to be placed in the capsule. Mm -hmm. So it comes time for him to launch, and something happens where the electric connections were misaligned or or dropped off or weren't connecting properly. So every time that Kennedy would send a request for him to do something, he would press the button and it would come back wrong. Oh no. And he would get zapped. Oh no. And the, the, he, this happened about 18 times to him and Ham was very upset. I'll bet. Very upset. Now, mind you, he's going up maybe for 60 minutes and he's down. Mm -hmm. And his trainer goes and opens the hatch to the capsule and he reaches in. And Ham is so upset that he turns and bites. Oh, no. Bites his trainer. Oh. Right on the arm. So the train, trainer is able to grab him, pull him on the, the boat up to the helicopter and bring him over to the, over to the, the ship. Well, he's downstairs and the media is there taking photographs left and right. And then they finally bring over a newspaper to him. <laughs> that is hilarious. Yeah, what a great shot. Yeah. yeah. Well, the media didn't have enough. And they wanted to have some photographs of him next to the capsule. Mm -hmm. So the trainer picks him up, walks him up to the deck. So that's walking over to the capsule, and the closer they get into the capsule, Ham is getting upset. Yeah. And getting closer, and he starts wrestling and fighting mm -hmm. with the trainer, and finally bites the trainer. Mm -hmm. Finally, it occurs to the trainer, Ham doesn't want to have anything to do with that capsule because yeah. of what it did to him. Right. And finally, he understood, and he went back downstairs. Mm hmm. So those are one of my favorite uh, stories about him. He was quite a quite a monkey, and uh, did you know launched us basically kept us going on in the space race. Um, well, I'm sorry he had to do it in such a painful way. Right, right. Yeah. Um, something I, I, I want to uh, point out: there are five programs. Mm -hmm. Mercury. Yep. Gemini, mm -hmm. Apollo, mm -hmm. 
the shuttle, mm -hmm. and today we have Artemis. You now the five different programs. Mm -hmm. Each now, I'm, and I'm emphasizing that word program. Mm -hmm. Mercury program is to get us to space. Right. That's all it was supposed to do. A one man launch into space and bring him back down again. Mm -hmm. Now with John Glenn, he was launched into space, but he orbited mm -hmm. four times. So that was basically the sole purpose of, of Mercury, to be able to go up and work in space. Um, now the Gemini, it's a different story because we needed to learn how to live mm -hmm. in space. Now, two different programs, okay? Alan Shepard, a hero. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I cannot say enough for Alan Shepard. He, um, you figure that after all of those explosions on the launch pad, that he was the gutsy guy that stepped into that capsule and was the first man to orbit. Mm-hmm. Excuse me, not orbit, yeah. but get, get to space. Yep. Mm -hmm. It was a 16-minute flight. He was up and back again. Yeah. Um, successful flight. He later went on, on, on Apollo and was one of the men that worked, walked on the moon. Mm -hmm. Gus Grissom. Now, Gus had the unfortunate, some unfortunate things happen. Right. One was that flash fire in Apollo 1. Yes, absolutely. That was a terrible yeah. situation. Now, he was the second man to be launched into space. Mm -hmm. Again, to orbit. he mm -hmm. was to go up and do the same thing as Alan Shepard, maneuver the spacecraft, and he returned again. You have a question? You have, are you questioning? No, no. Okay, so I think you, what I was, I, I guess, in my mind, I was thinking to myself that the order was Alan, John Glenn, then Gus. But you're, but I'm wrong. Gus's, he yeah, he he was a suborbital guy, correct? And uh, and he was actually number two, correct, on the program. And okay, John Glenn was three, right? Orbited. Yeah. Okay. Now something happened with Gus when he returned. Mm -hmm. He hit the water, and somehow the hatch blew, blew to yeah. the capsule. Mm -hmm. That was allowing water to stop coming into the capsule. Yeah. And he had a bail. What a scary moment for him. Yeah. And you In his suit, it. right? So. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you could do a, uh, a movie or a short film of him waving mm -hmm. to the uh, divers that here I am. Mm -hmm. Come and help me. Uh, and the capsule flooded and sank. Mm -hmm. It was about. 2015 when they did find the capsule and they pulled it up and it's now in a museum in kansas That's just cool. outside of kansas city now as i recall it was uh, about two miles deep and yeah. uh i i still have uh the original uh news clipping from a newspaper uh, my local newspaper uh -huh. that had uh, a picture of it down on the on the surface of the around the uh yeah on the, on the, on the floor the of the ocean yeah yeah, yeah. So he was pretty lucky there that they were able to uh, get Gus out of the water yeah. and to the to the helicopter. The helicopter was actually attached, mm -hmm. and it was trying to pull the the capsule out of the water, but it was just too heavy. Right, and they finally uh, cut the line and mm -hmm. it sank. Yeah, um, something I want to point out here. Here's a photograph of Gus Grissom with his wife and two boys. And if you can see the, uh, the, the suit that he's wearing, this is that same suit. Oh my gosh. Yeah, he had given it to his brother and his brother in turn gave it to us. Hmm. So you can see the, the size of Gus. He really wasn't that tall. I think and, all the astronauts were not not. They certainly weren't as tall as I am. I'm nearly six four, so that yeah, that wouldn't the, really fit in a capsule, I guess. The only uh, <laughs> there's two astronauts I know that are over six feet. One is Mike Massimino, who flew on the Hubble, and then uh, Scooter, or Scott Scott Altman. Both of them are very very tall astronauts. Mm -hmm. 
you know, after that great, the great speech from John Kennedy, we will send man to the moon and have him return safely to earth. Mm -hmm. uh, not because it's easy, but it's hard. Right. When Kennedy said that, he put a load on NASA. Mm -hmm. NASA all of a sudden, oh my God, by mm -hmm. the end of the decade? Right. They didn't have, they didn't know how to live in space. They did not know, they didn't even have a rocket. Right. Kennedy put a bundle yeah. on NASA. To, hey, get going. And NASA did. They really did. They ever? The, yes, they did. Moving over to Sam Benningfield, John Glenn, and Tom O'Malley. Before uh, John uh, Glenn flew, he was also part of creating the launch system, the launch pad. Mm. I mean, and I mean the entire. Mm -hmm. The, the entire field. Um, he would be putting in gas tanks. He'd be putting uh, cables in, plumbing, uh, everything. He everything that needed to be put out there in the uh, in the launch system. Benningfield and O'Malley, John Glenn a little bit before he launched, but they were the both of the big men that had created basically the launch system. Mm -hmm. Tom O'Malley was given the honor to press the button. This is the infamous button. Yep, to <laughs> launch John Glenn into space. John Glenn, as we know, uh, did four orbits and returned to Earth safely. Uh, later became a senator. Mm -hmm. He flew again on the shuttle when he was 70, 77. And... Um, Unfortunately, he's peace passed mm -hmm. within the past 10 years. Mm -hmm. Great guy. He, yeah. he was a strong man. This is a, NASA was doing a renovation of a building, and they were going in and taking everything out, and they opened up the locker, and there's John Glenn's hard hat. Oh, oh, hard hat. That's right there. How about that? You ever see the uh, jets in World War II, Korean War, where they would paint on the side of fighter jets? Yes. Yep. Well, the same woman decided to uh, draw these, and they s slipped it inside the capsule that John Glenn was going to fly. <laughs> and John went to look through the periscope to Earth, <laughs> and that's the first things that they saw. So no he had to. Uh, he wanted to meet these this lady that drew those. Pictures for him. <laughs> That's funny. Now something happened with uh, uh, Armstrong. He was launched in a, a Gemini capsule. Gemini and Apollo. The Gemini capsule. So we had launched a, a mock-up mm -hmm. in space, and Armstrong is on, in the capsule. And one of the things, big things they had to learn was to be able to dock mm -hmm. in space. Armstrong didn't have any difficulty at all docking, mm -hmm. but something happened while he was docking that th fired off the thruster, and the thruster started to spin mm -hmm. the capsule and the mock-up. Mm -hmm. Every once in a while, that, ca that thruster kept on firing off. It started to spin faster and faster and faster, and it got to a point where uh, Armstrong calls back into Houston. Houston, I am having a problem here. So they undocked, demated, shut down, I'm sorry, shut down the capsule, but then rebooted it five minutes later, brought the capsule under control. NASA ordered him home immediately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think he did a, one or two or orbits and he came right back home. Mm -hmm. The mock-up just continued to float out into space. Mm -hmm. Now this is that piece that was sending the signal to the thruster that spun the capsule. Mm -hmm. It is the part. That is the exact part. The exact part. That, oh, wow. Yeah. So that's been in space. Yeah. Huh. I'm going to take you over to uh, this room right here that honors the women. Uh, that work with NASA. The unsung heroes. Yes, they are. 
They really, really are. Um, Especially my understanding is uh, long before we ever got to a, uh, a point where we actually uh, sent a woman into space, women were very instrumental in uh, apparently doing a lot of the math that was required uh, to get us. Uh, yes, to get yeah, us there. Yeah. John Glenn was uh, very, very good. Uh, counting on the women up in Ohio mm -hmm. to get him the right information. Mm -hmm. But since you brought that up, I'm mm -hmm. glad you did. <laughs> Let me point out Valentina. Valentina is a Russian. Mm -hmm. She was the first woman in space. And this is back in 1960s. Mm -hmm. Our first female from the United States is Sally Ride. Right. And she flew in 1983. Now, the United States would not allow any women to fly in space until 1983, Sally Ride. But the Russians yeah. chose Valentina back in 1960. Yeah. Now, you know, I'm kind of looking at things as backwards here, mm -hmm. where uh, the Russians being a communist and an unfree country, mm -hmm. but they're allowing Valentina to fly, but they're not allowing any other women to fly here in the United States until 1983. Yeah. Reason being... One, they didn't have the uh, test pilot or uh, experience in, in flying. Mm -hmm. They uh, also physically, they felt that they could not handle the G-force and they didn't have upper body strength that we had. Mm -hmm. But of course, on space, you don't need yeah. right. that. Uh, G-force, G-force you get used to. Uh, that's why you have uh, the training camp in, the Houston, in Houston the astronaut training camp, and that's where you would learn how to adapt to the G-force that you would experience. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to move over to Apollo. Now Apollo is, is the program for Apollo is getting to the moon. Right. And it's the next step in which uh, now we've uh, built one of the biggest rockets in the world. Incredible, incredible the, the size. Have you been over to the visitor center? I have not. Uh, they have a center out, uh, they have an area out there, the Saturn building, where they have the Saturn laid out in a horizontal, and it is just mammoth. Wow. You would not believe how big this thing is. Yeah. So, first stage, second stage. This is the stage right here that's getting us to the moon. Mm -hmm. That drops away and now we have the lunar module. Mm -hmm. This upper part is the capsule. The emergency area is already gone. Mm -hmm. So this is the area right here that's going to the moon. Mm -hmm. Just as it's arriving from the moon, the lunar module drops out and the capsule rotates and joins, mates with the uh, lunar module. Mm -hmm. If you look a little bit closer here, in this upper stage, just above where the lunar module is, mm -hmm. that's where the that's the area where the door was, the side was blown out mm -hmm. in Apollo 13. Right. The capsule was already attached to the lunar module, uh -huh. so that made things a little bit better for the astronauts. Yeah, thankfully it was there as a lifeboat. Yeah, and that's where we came back and returned to return to Earth. Mm -hmm. Uh, some of the interesting uh, handprints. Oh, Armstrong, Armstrong yep. Yeah. Uh, Aldrin. Now, Aldrin is, is alive. Mm -hmm. He must be about 93 right now. Mm, yeah. And he recently got married at 91. No kidding. Go, and to go, a bud. young woman of 61 years old. <laughs> right. So he's quite uh -huh. a, a lively guy. <laughs> Looks like he had a wedding ring on when he did this. <laughs> <laughs> Bill Nelson is our NASA director. Mm -hmm. That's a tough job. That oh, is a yeah, very, no very tough job. I'll bet. Uh, quick thing about the, uh, well, Skylab. Skylab was uh, damaged on launch. Right. And um, they were supposed to be uh, sending Bob Griffin back right up afterwards, about four hours after. Uh -huh. And uh, so they held him back. 
and uh, they found out what the problem was with the Skylab and uh, he went up and he did the repair. He did the repair work on the Skylab and he could, was able to continue his mission. Yeah, that's cool. If you know anybody that has a book like that, that's uh, a very rare book and very much wanted. Mm. That's worth a lot of money. So if you know anybody... Sadly, I don't have one. But. So if you know anybody, that's worth some, uh, some bucks. Good morning, sir. Are we able to yes, operate? we're all ready to go again here. We've kind of getting wrapped up. You want to meet some history? Absolutely. Oh, this gentleman goodness. right here installed this equipment as well as the equipment we just saw. No kidding. He was the one that installed it in the command center. Wow. And when it became, this equipment became obsolete, he was the one that installed it for us here at the museum. <laughs> That's great. Well, so we've we, got we, some we history. Lucky, the Air Force, uh, the Air Force gave it to us in 2012. Ah. It had been, they built uh, about 23 or 24 of these from 1954 to 1960. And what, what specifically does this thing do? Well, I'm going to give you that. Okay. It's, it's called a Mod 4 sequencer. Oh, yeah. The older ones were called a firing system. They would generate the countdown, the display, oh. and we're going to run a simulated launch here for you in a minute. Oh, perfect. Wow. But anyway, these, these would generate the countdown. They were the, you might say, the link between the missile range and the missile contractor. See, the missile contractor fired all of them, but the missile range had the range safety mm -hmm. and uh, all the radar and telemetry support and everything. So they, uh, this was, was operated by the range. I, I worked with them out there for a lot of years, but this particular one was used to uh, support Pershing launches, which were the... Uh, short range ballistic missile that was deployed in Germany and Turkey. You may remember the 62 missile crisis, they oh. were fighting about those. Yep. But anyway, uh, this one was, was got away from the scrap pile because it was installed in the last Pershing launch facility on the Cape that was allowed to keep during the 74 uh, nuclear arms agreement. Oh, mm -hmm. and it sat there in that old blockhouse, not being used for years and years and years. But it's my opinion, and this is not fact that that's why it survived, is because it was a, a Pershing launch facility that they had the okay to keep. Yeah. Anyway, it uh, it was in bad shape, corroded, mm. everything. When we finally talked the Air Force into donating it to this museum. Mm -hmm. Because all the others had gone to the scrap pile by the mid '80s, they were junked and shipped out. I don't know how much stuff they'd like to have back now that they threw it away. Mm -hmm. Anyway, let's uh, let's run this thing once, and you can listen to the. We're gonna start the countdown. Is that thing still on? Yes, it's still on. I okay. got a TV up there that was. Uh, excuse me. Let me get mm -hmm. this stuff out of your way here, and you can say now. Well, I don't need to sit. I was just looking for a better angle. <laughs> Take your seat there. This thing, will, this thing is getting started up to play a. Uh, now, while it's doing that, I didn't get your name, sir. Uh, Mac. Mac. Mac my name's Tom. Nice to meet you, Mac. Mac, how old are you? What's that? How old? Well, I'll be 91 next Mac. month. No kidding! Wow. And Good for I'm, you. I'm the last guy alive. Well, what's, what's, your the what's your secret? What's your secret? How'd you well, get there? I don't have no secrets. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is, I'm the last guy alive that ever worked on one of these. She's talking up right now. You may want to listen to that. Eight hundred hundreds of missile launches at Cape Canaveral for over 30 years. This type of sequencer was used in launch complexes 31, 32, 34, and 37 for many band and Saturn I launches. In the late 1970s, this sequence was moved to Lockout 16 to support Pershing launches. After the last launch, it remained here with no environmental control 
for over 24 years and was melted, molded, rusted, and corroded when donated to this museum in 2012. All of the other sequencers were gone by the mid-1980s. This sequencer was cleaned and repaired and still operates very well. Countdown with me and watch the launch. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. We have ignition. Lift off. Now, and it's been running here for almost 12 years. Wow. And it looks like uh, like a big breadboarding yeah. kind of thing up here. It's, a, it's a, an old mechanical computer and it's programmed right uh -huh. there. Yeah. Do everything that it does, yes. Interesting. So very cool. Thank you, sir. Yep. Always a pleasure, yeah, Always a pleasure yeah, to yeah. see you. Nice to meet you, sir. Yes, sir. I appreciate it. Hey, Daryl. How are you? So, say hello to Tom. He's uh, here for uh, the hello, Wisconsin sir. News. Hello. News broadcast. I'm sorry, I didn't. I didn't catch your name. I'm Darren. Darren. Yep. Tom. I, yep. I, I am the uh, science coordinator here. I do uh, elementary age uh, science classes. Oh, cool. So we have about 500 students a month. Of no the kidding. Month. Wow, that's great. Yeah, so they must they must just love this. They must just eat it up. Oh, oh we're having a ball. I'll bet. Uh, I'll bet. That's great. Super. Yeah, so th this month we're actually studying water and you know properties of water. We do uh, surface tension experiments. We talk about how water gets recycled on the, how we recycle water on the space station uh -huh. because water doesn't bond with stuff. We actually have an electrolysis unit that separates water into hydrogen and oxygen. And then you know for rocket fuel, uh -huh. and then we bump, make it make bubbles out of it in the cup and touch it and it explodes. Uh, the kids actually do a whole bunch of hands-on experiments. The favorite one is they make cube-shaped soap bubbles. <laughs> cool. <laughs> so so I, I get to play with kids all day long. And so so how often do they come in? Is this? Uh, I, I do about 15 days out of the course of each month, uh -huh. and we do three classes a day, 12 to 15 kids per group. And these are different schools There's from all around the area? Some, some schools, a lot of homeschool co-ops. Oh, yeah. Um, the Saturday programs is just whoever wants to come. Mm -hmm. So, Oh, well, that's just awesome. Yep, we love so doing cool. what we're doing. So cool. Well, nice to meet so, you. Very nice meeting you. Nice Enjoy meeting. your travels. Thank you. This area right here is pretty tough. Because this is basically the area that I would, was working in for the Hubble. Mm. This is tough because so much is going on uh, at the same time that it's hard for me to put it all together. Yeah. But I'm going to break it down. Okay. So after the after it's all been inspected, maybe the tiles, the electronics, communication, this thing is checked out from the top to bottom. Mm-hmm. Rolls out of the room and now moves over to vertical assembly building. Mm -hmm. Okay, in a horizontal position. In the vertical assembly building, the boosters are all now inside. The shuttle rolls in. They hook up a crane. They pick it up, rotate it to a vertical position, lift and attach it to the boosters. Mm -hmm. The crawler. The crawler now has two large diesel engines in it. 148 gallons of diesel fuel per mile. Oh, wow. There's a, 
uh, a three mile, three and a half mile uh, ride out to the launch pad. Mm -hmm. We ship all of our equipment from Goddard Space Flight Center down to Kennedy, and Kennedy gives us a special building. And with all of our equipment now, we're starting to uh, populate the transporters. All of that equipment has to be tested from Goddard to make sure that it arrives safely and functioning properly down here at Kennedy. Mm -hmm. That's about a three-month job. Hmm. Now we have the canister. See the, the white, is, it looks like the shuttle bay. Mm -hmm. It is the same size as the shuttle bay. And we now take the carriers and we put it in on the inside of the shuttle bay. Okay, so the canister is on on this on this machine right here. Mm -hmm. It's about the size from the uh, wall to this wall right here. The canister is on this platform right here in a hor horizontal position. It rolls over into this clean room. We populate the canister with all of the uh, transporters. Mm -hmm. Now it rolls out to the out to the launch facility, launch pad, rolls right underneath the pad right here, underneath this tower. A crane comes down and hooks to us in a vertical position, picks it up, and lifts it into this area right here, which is a clean room. There's a class 10,000 clean room out at the launch pad. See this white area right here? Mm -hmm. That's a class 10,000 clean room. So the doors open up inboard, and the, the canister doors open up inside the clean room, okay? These floors move. These floors move in and out, up and down, to be able to move out and grasp onto these trunnions. Once they grasp onto the trunnions, they pull everything out of the canister, and they bring it into the clean room. These doors close, just like the shuttle. These two doors close. We're back into a class 10,000 clean room. We have positive pressure and like a bladder. A bladder inflates and it basically seals the outside from making sure that no dirt gets on the inside and there's positive pressure pushing any dirt that could get in pushing it back up. Mm -hmm. Ten, class 10,000 clean room, very, very clean. Barry, thank you so much Pleasure. for taking us on this tour. It has been most informative. And uh, I think that uh, everybody who is anywhere near the Titusville area should absolutely come in, see you, uh, see the uh, museum. It's a wonderful resource for everybody to, uh, you know, uh, relive uh, well for for us older guys to yeah. to relive what went yeah. on, or for you know the, the younger generation to actually see what we went through as we ramped up to where we are today. But again, thank you so much for the my tour. pleasure, my pleasure, Tom. Please come back again. I will. <laughs>